We are in our Be the Victor sermon series. Today we're talking about Nehemiah. I got to talk about next week though. Really excited about next week. I'm excited about today. But next week I'm talking about Jesus, the ultimate victor and what he's done and who he is and how he loves. So don't miss next week. I'm really having a hard time feeling like I can adequately explain how great he is. I haven't felt that on any of these other people, but as I, as I went over my sermon this week for Jesus, I'm like, oh man, I'm not sure I'm showing them how great he is. Lord, help me. So you can pray for me that I can present him accurately, but I'm excited about that next week. This week, Nehemiah, and I'm calling it Build Something Great. Building Something Great. Would, would you like for God to build something great using your life? <clears throat> You say, well, I don't, you know, I don't want to build a building. I, I don't really want to build a ministry. But what, what if you build your family? What if you uh, build a network so people can connect and love Jesus and, and know about him more? There's so many things that he might move your heart towards. I'm praying that you'll see that as you open your heart with unique gifts and talents that he's given you, that he will give you something to do to advance his kingdom. So let's talk about Nehemiah. He's not a prophet. He's not a preacher. Instead, he's just a man in a high position of government. He works beside the king, Artaxerxes, say that fast three times, in Persia. That's the king. And he's serving him as the cupbearer. That doesn't sound like a very important position, but it's pretty important because he was the one that drank all the fluids just before the king did to make sure if there's any poison in there that he would die instead of the king. So you had to have a trustworthy person and uh, you had to have someone with great courage. Nehemiah is working very closely with a king who does not know God, doesn't follow God. And the backdrop here of this whole story, it's important to know that the Jewish people were returning to Jerusalem after a 70-year period of captivity in Persia. So they've been held as slaves for 70 years. Suddenly they're released. They get to go back to Jerusalem, and they're trying to reestablish their culture and their faith in this promised land that God has given them, the holy city of Jerusalem. And that's the, that's the backdrop. And Nehemiah hears that those who uh, survived the exile and are back in Jerusalem, are saying that there's some bad things that have taken place. There is a disaster there. They they can't believe it that everything is ruined and rubble, and the city is not protected. So let's talk about it. First thought that I want to ask you is, number one, do you cry for what God cries for? We see Nehemiah crying in the scriptures here. Let's pick it up. We're going to read a lot of Bible today. Maybe you can go to Nehemiah 1 in your touch device or Bible and follow along. The words are up on the screen for you today, but we're going to read a lot. Verse 1, the words of Nehemiah. So this is Nehemiah telling the story. Son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, by the way, I had to practice all those words right there. One of my brothers came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. So he said, hey, how's it going? And they said to him, those who survived the exile are back in the province uh, and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. Disgrace? What is this? The wall of Jerusalem is completely broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. Nehemiah says, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. So he cried. Do we cry for the things that God cries for? He's not crying for himself here. He's crying for for others. He's crying for God's people. For some days I mourned and I fasted and I prayed before the God of heaven. So there were some Jews who survived. Here's the setting, this exile. And now they're going back to Jerusalem and they say, man, there's great trouble and shame. That's the word they send on ahead. The walls of Jerusalem were destroyed. And in essence, the city was ripe for invasion. In those days, when you had a a, a major city, you built a tall, powerful, thick stone wall to protect you against the enemy. And that meant that you could not be easily invaded. That meant that you'd be fighting with an advantage looking down and the protection around you 
Well, it wasn't only that they could be destroyed by invading armies because Israel always had trouble with surrounding countries. They were always coming after God's people. But it wasn't just war, it was businesses. The businesses were not able to flourish due to the risk of the outsiders that were a threat. It was imminent that they could come in and take over. So not even the businesses could get, could get going. And Nehemiah sat down and he wept. The holy city of Jerusalem is uncovered. The holy city is vulnerable. It's in rubble. I find it interesting that he could have ignored the message that came to him from Jerusalem. I mean, he's sitting in the king's office. He's hanging with the king. He's got a good salary. He's not in trouble. Nobody's after him. There's no, nothing for him to cry about in his family. But instead of thinking just for himself and ignoring the message, instead of just saying, I've got a pretty good life, I'm not going to mess there. Instead of shrugging it off and saying, well, it's not my problem, Nehemiah weeps for his people and he cries out to God for mercy. Nehemiah 1, let's look at it. It's his prayer. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps the covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer from your servants praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. And listen to this. I confess the sins we is, I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. He's not only accepting responsibility for his sin, he's accepting responsibility for the nation of Israel's sin. We've acted very wickedly towards you. We've not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, and isn't it beautiful in the Old Testament that though the nation of Israel continually denies God and goes against his will, that God just keeps reaching in love. He just keeps reaching to them, trying to draw them to himself. A lot of people don't think there's grace in the Old Testament. I'm telling you, when you look at the overall story, there's, there's amazing grace that God is providing to draw them to himself, but they're choosing not to follow him. And as a result, they're having trouble. Did you know if you choose not to follow him that you might have some trouble as well? Like he writes some things in his word and people say, well, everyone sins. Everyone makes mistakes. And that's true. But we can say that so flippantly that we will give way to sin. And as a result, we'll be in a lot worse place. Let's talk about that. We'll talk more in a minute here. But if you return to me and obey my commands... Then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them. Here's that grace, even in the Old Testament. I want to bring you back. I love you. I want things to go well with you. I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Verse 10, they are your servants and your people whom you redeem by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success. Interesting, he prays for success and favor. I think that's okay, especially when you're doing God's work. Pray for success and favor. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. He's talking about the king. He's afraid to go before the king. I was the cupbearer to the king. So he cries out to God, and it reveals his character. It shows that he truly longed for his people to walk with God and he understood the consequences of sin. Sin destroys. Isaiah 48, 17 says this, and it's for us too. This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I'm the Lord, your God, who teaches you what is best for you. Okay, so God's not, let's just stop for a minute. God's not telling you about his morality about what he says is righteousness just because he wants you to obey so he can feel good about himself. God's pretty secure. Like he doesn't need you to love him for him to be okay. He just loves you so much he wants to bless you. You're his creation and he, he wants to bless you. 
And when we sin, people say, well, God's not a God up in heaven who punishes and who hurts and who harms. And I, I believe that that's not the heart of God, a heart of love. But how about if we look at it a different way? How, do, how about if we look at a covering that God wants to give us with his word and his direction? How about if we look at his commands and things that he says are right that we should do and follow? Well, if he gives us that and we choose to move out from under that covering and go do our own thing, if we choose to cross the boundaries that God says are safe, at some level, we've left him. He hasn't left us. And we're making ourselves vulnerable to the elements and we get out there and families get broken and people get hurt and people get addicted and all kinds of pain happens. And the irony is we often will say, God, where are you? And God would speak to us and say, where are you? I'm, I'm right here. I've never moved. I have this place of safety for you, but you've chosen not to walk in it. And as a result, you're getting hurt. Come back to me that I might bless you. That's what he would say to Israel. And he's, he said this. I want to read it again. This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord your God who teaches you what is best for you, who directs you in the way you should go and listen to his heart. If only you had paid attention to my commands your peace would have been like a river, your well-being like the waves of the sea. People say, well, I, I can't, who, who can live completely righteous? Well, does that mean you shouldn't, you shouldn't follow God's directive when he says, be holy even as I'm holy? Does that mean you shouldn't get in the game where you can continually improve and get better? We live in a society, in a day, in an age, in our world where often the church is saying sin uh, is something that you can't overcome in any manner, so just yield to it. Not directly, but indirectly, that's being spoken. Unconditional love. I, I, you know what I prefer to call it? Perfect love. The word unconditional is not in the Bible that way, but perfect love, the perfect love of God is there. And the perfect love of God would direct you to a way where you will be blessed. That's his heart for you. He's not trying to make you do anything. not trying to take away your fun. He's trying to take away your pain. So he says, if you'll follow me, I'll give you a blessing. You say, well, we, nobody can really overcome. Okay, let's just explore that a little bit. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It says that when you're tempted, God will make a way of escape so you can stand up under it and overcome. Huh. So at some level... We need to understand that the grace of God, which not only forgives, I think people who think grace, the grace of God is only about forgiveness underestimate grace. Because Titus 2.11 says this, the grace of God that leads to salvation teaches us to say no to all forms of ungodliness. You know, when people say, those missionaries, by the grace of God, they endured those 30 years and they overcame. You, do you see what they're saying about grace? The grace is empowering. The grace brings them through. The grace helps them overcome. And God says in his word, I can help you live godly. You know what it takes to overcome sin? Like, okay, let's get this out there because you're wondering. I, I've not been able to be perfect, so just so you know, right? I'm not saying that. You haven't been able to be perfect. But how about those that say, you know, I'm just angry. And, you, you know, that's just who I am. I just like to talk that way. And, and you guys need to accept me as I am. Well, no, that'll tear up a family, won't it? That'll hurt some kids who never want to talk to you again. That'll bring pain and heartache all the way through. So you need to be self-aware. We do with all of our sin at some level and say, that's not only hurting me, it's hurting others. And God says he's big enough to help me overcome. I can grow. I can get better. I can become more like Jesus until the day that I am with him. And that's the goal, to become more and more like Jesus. We'll talk about that one more next week. But he wants to help us. And how often do we humble ourselves and repent? To repent means not only to say, hey, I'm sorry I did that, but it means to turn and go another direction. And I say this about sin. It takes willpower to overcome it. You say, that's heresy. Heresy means really bad doctrine. But it's not because it takes your will and his power. If you don't have a will to turn and go away from something, pornography, anger, sexual sin, Cheating, lying, stealing. I mean, you know, the thing about lying is it works in the moment, but it does not work in the long run. Because there'll come a day when that person won't trust you again 
And God says, I don't want that to happen for you. And I certainly don't that ref- want that reflection for my character. God says, I'd like you to be like me so that people can see who I am. And so we really can get better. He really will help us. We really can overcome. We don't have to do, if your dad was not good to you when you grew up, you do not have to go that direction. You can say, God, I know what it feels like. I know how it hurts. I know the pain of it. But I also know that you're a loving father, that you've never failed me, that you've never made a mistake. And I also know that you can forgive me for my mistakes and help me to overcome and to be better. So Lord, I'm, I'm going to get in behind you. Jesus, I'm going to follow you and I pray you'd help me to be a good man and a good dad so that I can show your love. Did you know that Jesus wept over sin too? I mean, here we have Nehemiah weeping over the city of Jerusalem. There's a place in the New Testament in Luke chapter 19 where Jesus is weeping over Jerusalem as well. Same city. What's going on there? It says in verse 41, as Jesus approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. And he said, if even you had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. See, he, he's, he's saying, man, I just wanted to draw you close. I wanted to cover you. I wanted to bless you, but you, you didn't come to me. You're not receiving me. Verse 43, the day will come. Now, th- these are the words of read in the Bible too. These are the words of Jesus. Sometimes we make... We, 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 don't, we, don't, we don't think about the strong name of Jesus and the all-powerful, almighty. He's coming on a white horse to bring destruction to uh, the enemy of our soul someday. And there'll be destruction that's meted out in the book of Revelation too. And look, look here, he's, he's all loving, but it's his definition of love, not the world's, okay? Verse 43, the day will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you, it's a word of prophecy from Jesus to the city of Jerusalem, and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and your children within your walls. He's not saying, I'm doing this to you because I don't love you. He said, because you chose to get away from me, because you chose not to follow me, because you don't want my covering. I'm just telling you, you wanted to be on your own, and this was what it will bring. They will not leave one stone or another uh, uncovered because you did not know or recognize the time of God's coming to you. He means himself, the Messiah. I came to you and you did not receive. You chose to walk in your sin and away from me. God shows his great faithfulness to his people in spite of their repeated failures. And by the way, that, that word that Jesus gave 70 years later was fulfilled in history where Jerusalem was overcome again as they had turned against God. But we see it in the Old Testament. We see it through all these stories. We see with Nehemiah, the grace of God is greater than our sin. He keeps reaching, even though we made mistakes. He keeps loving. He keeps trying to draw us to himself. This is Titus 2, 11 and 12. And it's a, it's a different version than the one I qu- quoted earlier. But I like the way this reads too. It says this, look at it close. For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. And we are instructed to turn away from godless living and sinful pleasures. Hmm. You think God would tell us to turn away from things if we weren't able to? You think he'd tell us to turn away from things if he wasn't going to help us overcome them? Like this is a part we want to leave out these days. I'm sorry, there's a bit of the prophetic in me. You're either going to have to put up with it or um, just pray for me. But it just seems so direct to me. Do you know the difference between pleasure the enemy's way and pleasure God's way? Sinful pleasure spoken of here, it can happen with sexuality. You can have immediate pleasure, but what it brings is long-term pain. That's the enemy's way. Immediate pleasure, long-term pain. God's way is a level of discipline and restraint, a level of understanding and following, and long-term pleasure. So there's some immediate denial but trusting him and then long-term pleasure. For instance, God created sexuality. He created sex to be within the confines of a marriage between a biological man and a biological woman, and it's a good and a healthy thing. And when you get outside of those boundaries, you'll have all kinds of pain. You'll, there'll, there'll be divorces. There'll, there'll be heartache. And a couple might make it through, but trust is broken 
And it even makes it hard to stay married and stay faithful if you're unfaithful all these years before you get into a marriage. But if you'll follow his way, and if you'll trust him, even in this, this is just one area, but if you'll trust him in this and say, okay, I want to I be faithful to the Lord. I, I'm not a prude, but I want to be faithful to the Lord, and I'm going to wait for that person. And then that person, they're so valuable to you, you meet them, and you, you, you come together, you, you join as man and wife, and then there's this beauty of intimacy that happens. Did you know you guys are getting something the last service didn't get on this. Um, but did you know that God's sex is better than any sex out there? Better than the world's? And here's why. Because when you do it God's way, there's an intimacy there. There's a beauty of just me and this person. Not just about the physical. The world's sex, so often all we see on TV and all these songs, it's, it's all about the physical. But it's not about the heart and the mind. It's not about heart, mind, soul. It's not about the being of this person. And when two people are totally committed and it's exclusive right here, there's something that happens in the beauty of that union that God has planned that the world can't match. Can't match it. They say they can, but they're lying. Short-term pleasure, long-term pain. A level of restraint and then, then pleasure that there'll be no harm in as you go forward. And it's a blessing. And how many of you know when mom and dad stay together, it's a cool thing for the family? It just is. I know that people turn away and, and there are people who are faithful and, and I know that we've all made mistakes, but it's, if we'll follow his plan, there's beauty that can be there. And he not only says that, he says we should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God. Can I just say that some people act like that word righteous is a bad word these days. I mean, they just need to get down and pray and ask God, why did you use that word righteous? You were wrong. He's not wrong. That's the bottom line, right? You can, we can do it. He can help us. We, can we be perfect? I wouldn't say that we can be perfect. The word tells us that we cannot. But we can grow and we can become self-aware and we can trust him and he'll meet us immediately and things can turn and the beauty of what he's planned will come to our lives. All right, second thought. I got to fly here, man. I'm, I'm going slow. Build for his glory. Build your family. Build that network. Build those relationships so people can come to Jesus. Whatever it is, give your life to him. I, I would say this. If you will come close to God, one of the first things he'll do is give you his heart for other people who don't know him. Elliot talked about the presence of the Lord, and I had the privilege of being a district youth director for the state of Oregon, the Assemblies of God, for six years. And we, we had 20 camps a year up on the mountain. Sandy and Pass. And do you know there were times that we would pray and we, we, we would be done with the service and teenagers would pray for two to four hours and the presence of God would fall. Honest to goodness. Who, who could believe teenagers would pray for two to four hours? I've, I've seen it a hundred times. And one of the things that always happens when the presence of God falls, it's not the only thing, but when the Holy Spirit moves on people's hearts and lives, one of the things that happens is God reveals his love for the lost. That, that just happens on a regular basis when the presence of the Lord is moving. That tears can come to someone's heart and life the same way they came to Nehemiah because you realize what, to, what being lost really is. And suddenly it's not just about you anymore. Suddenly the Lord has given you a burden for something that stays in your heart. And as you follow him, he'll, he'll move you towards something. Can I tell you this? His biggest dream for your life is not all about you and your family. His dream would be about building his kingdom somewhere. And then he'll use you and your family to do it as you go together. But, but we're here to build his kingdom, to move along with him. So building for his glory in the month of Nisan, formerly called Dotson, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought before him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. This is Nehemiah now. He's afraid. He's going before the king. He's about to ask. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? This cannot be nothing but sadness of heart. And Nehemiah says, I was very much afraid. Let me tell you why I was afraid. Because it was against the law, there had been a decree that you could not be sad in the king's presence. If you were sad, you could die. This is a pagan king. You look at him wrong, he can just say, take him out right there and they're gone. He's afraid because he could die. He's revealing his sadness. 
<clears throat> he's about to make a plea, excuse me, <clears throat> he's putting himself on the line for God and God's work here. But I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, what is it you want? I just get the feeling here that when you're a good man that loves God and you treat people well around you, that even the king has good feelings about who you are because you care and he can see it. And I got a feeling he liked him. I can't back that up, but he's about to do some great things for him. And I know God is moving on his heart, but it says this, then I prayed to the God of heaven. Can I tell you this? That was just in a moment there. This is a cool verse right here. King said, what is it? And he said, I prayed to the God of heaven. We do that on a regular basis here at Horizon, even in staff meetings. When we're, <clears throat> when we're coming to a problem or an issue or we're addressing something and we're talking about, we'll just stop and say, let's pray and ask the Lord for his wisdom here. If you're about to give a presentation at work, if you're about to talk to someone uh, who needs Jesus, whatever it may be, however important it may be, if you'll just stop I believe he did it under his breath. I don't think he hit his knees and cried out loud in front of the king. We don't see that. But here, here's what I think he did. Oh, God, this is a scary thing. This guy could take me out. I need you to give me wisdom. I need you to fill my mouth with your words. You know what he needs to hear. I don't, God, help me. I just think it was quick like that. And then he spoke to the king and answered and said, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah, where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king, with the queen sitting right beside him, asked me, how long will your journey take, and when will you get back? And it pleased the king to send me, so I said out of time. Man, he gets favor. I think Nehemiah is a perfect example of how a person is, who is devoted to God does not need to be in professional ministry in order to, to be effective or fruitful. He's just a guy. He's a dude. He's, you know, you, you think of preachers and you, you, we hear about preachers a lot or prophets or priests in the Bible. We talk about them, but we're all ministers. Every one of us. And he wants to use our lives. And here's a guy who becomes a governor. He's a politician. I believe we need some good godly politicians. I don't do a lot of politics from this pulpit. But I'm going to tell you, righteousness exalts a nation. And it'd be good for our nation if we had some good godly people who were in there making decisions. And we've got one guy, Glenn Lancaster, running for state representative this week. Pray for him because he's a good, faithful man. And we need good, faithful women and good, faithful men, even in politics, entertainment. We need them everywhere. You can be used by God in business in an incredible fashion. Do you know some of the most effective people I've ever seen who are some of the greatest witnesses are people who have businesses that they're just faithful for a lot of years in. They never lie. They never cheat. They never steal. They go the extra mile. They try to bless people, encourage people. They're also people who are building their business for God. Like they think God owns it. It's his. And then they would even be willing at times to share in a place where God might give them an opportunity. I mean, if we're going to reach this world, it's not going to be by, by those who are lost just looking at this sanctuary and thinking, I need to go in there. Now, I've heard some stories like that before. I know the Lord can move that way. You know how they're going to come in here? It's you and me. But it may not, they could find Jesus here, but you know God's real plan is for us to just hit the street and love people and reach them and care about them and then share what he's done for us and help them to know him. Well, Nehemiah's given his all here. I want you to know that God created you the way he did for a reason. You have specific talents and strengths and he'll use you incredibly. Here's Nehemiah's major talent and strength. He's a tremendous administrator. Tremendous organizer, governor. Those, those gifts, the gift of administration and the gift of organization are not my gifts. I might look like I have it together, but the, you know, I, I've improved in those things along the way, but those are not my gifts. I'm a vision, communication, uh, sharing person with conviction and passion, and I work hard, but if I don't have the Jay Andersons, if I don't have the Randy Campbells, if I don't have the Josh Davises, 
All I do is get everybody excited about something that we can't pull off because we don't have a good plan. We have to sit with the team, find a good plan, and it's not, I'm not trying to say it's all about what I choose, but I'm just saying, if you don't have these gifts, you're not going anywhere. And some of you have this gift of administration, and it's amazing. It's very impressive to me, I'll tell you that, because I don't have it. And, and organization, I don't even want to be that organized. It's no fun. It just seems like all those little details, they're like prison to me, you know. I want to be free. But, but I know we need, I know we need order, right? I know we need that at some level to overcome. And isn't it beautiful how God gives a man and a woman in marriage, it seems like one of them's always organized and the other one's kind of a spur of the moment. Are there any marriages out there? Raise your hand. That's Karen and I. Okay, yeah. Completely different. Opposites attract, not just attack. They attract. And so that's, that's good. Well, we see that the king gives this guy everything. Everything you want. Gives him a letter. You have free reign. I'll give you the resources. He gets favor from God. He asks for that and God gives it to him. The king says, go and get it done. And because, here's what, here's what Nehemiah says. He gives God all the glory. This is chapter two, verse eight. And because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my request. We need to know as we go that the reason that we have success is because God is doing it. So I want to tell a little bit of our story here. I know some of you have heard this before, but this is a passing parade. You know, there's a number of people that are here today in either one of these services that weren't here last year. They've never been here before. So let me tell you a little bit about our history. We felt that God was calling us to buy a piece of property and to build a big Christian school and even a larger church on that property because he was going to do some things. This was about 20 years ago. We prayed it through. We walked through it with the elders and leadership. And we felt like we should try to move and see what God would say. And you know, God's the one who does it. But if you're not faithful, he, work, he works through people. So we didn't do it. But we, we had to work. Faith without works is dead. We had, we had to work and have faith to move towards his will. One day I went to visit the county planner in Hillsboro 20 years ago. And I said to him, if we buy 40 acres, would we be allowed at Horizon Community Church to build a large Christian school and a large church? And he said, well, the answer to that question is yes, but the real answer is no, because that land would cost so much money that not even God or the Pope could help you get that land. I thought, well, he's half right, you know. <laughs> but something rose up in me in that moment. I said, oh, you shouldn't have said that. And so I said that directly to the guy. John Priest was there watching. I said, because God, you're going you're to watch and see that God's big enough. Well, about seven years later, that guy signed for us to be on this land with a permit. And remember that even though God will call you to something, even though he'll give you success, that there's perseverance in the call that he would give you. And you need to know this, you will be opposed if you're doing something for God. As you go, as you're given a dream by God, as he puts it in your heart, you need to know that when you follow the will of God, it will be difficult. If it's worth going towards it would be God's will and the enemy will make sure to oppose it because good things will happen that the devil doesn't like to see. Nehemiah 4.10. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out and there's so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. So they've got all this rubble that has to be removed. Sometimes in your dream, you're just gonna have to remove a bunch of yucky stuff that someone went before or did. Maybe you're witnessing to someone and someone really hurt them. You've got you've to try to slowly in a relationship lead them back to understanding how God loves them and cares for them and how they're precious to the Lord. And it may take time to remove that rubble, but you'll also face criticism in life when you're doing something for God that he's called you to do. Sanballat and Tobiah are two probably governors themselves they are leaders over other regions that would war against Jerusalem and they come on the scene to criticize. Anything worth doing for God will be criticized as the enemy will make sure. He'll do it with people 
who don't know God, pagans who'll come after you like Sanballat and to- Tobiah, or sometimes he unwittingly works through believers who don't realize that their words of criticism can discourage people. If you're doing anything for God, the enemy will oppose you. But we have to follow and move. Now, I'm going to do something I've never done here before. I'm going to make a positive illustration about video games. Here it is right here. First one you've ever heard from me. All right? I don't like video games. I'll tell you why. Because when my son was seven, we played a baseball game. And at the end of the inning, I was trying my best. It was 31 to 1. That was the end of my video career. He said, Dad, do you want me to play easy? And I said, no, I just don't want to play anymore. And that was it. It was over. But video games, did you know that the more the battle intensifies in this third person shooter games, you know, the more the battle intensifies, the closer you are to achieving the target or goal. When he gets hot and heavy, you're close to the goal. But if the way's clear and there's no struggle, then you know you're actually walking the wrong way. You got to turn around and go another direction and run into that battle to get to the goal. And it's kind of that way with God that you'll, you'll be opposed. If you're getting close, you're going to be opposed. He'll come against with lies and trouble and Maybe financial hardship, but our goal is not to do it. God does it. Our goal is to be faithful and to stay with it and to answer the call that he's given us. Years ago, a guy nearby here donated some land to us. And that was one of the reasons we moved on the campaign to start to buy that land. And actually, it's the land we're, we're on right now. But the problem was he didn't own it. And I had talked to the church that someone had donated it before I checked it out, which was a big mistake. And then we found out the guy doesn't even own it. And then I had to go for the church just a few days before our financial commitments. Did you know there are people who gave, they sold houses, they sold cars, they turned in some retirement funds so that we might be here today. Unbelievable, man. I just appreciate those people so much. I'm not going to be asking you to do that as we go forward here in the new future. I'll tell you that. But we're grateful for the day when God called us to do it and people stepped up. And and a small congregation raised millions because God was doing something amazing. But just before our pledges, this guy pulls it back. I have to get up on a Sunday morning three days before our pledge day and say, actually, there is no donated land. Uh, But we're just going to go forward and trust the Lord. And, uh, and I believe it's his will, and someday this will be a blip on the screen. Well, now it is, just a blip on the screen behind us. Because a few days later, the leaders and people of this church pledged about um, $1.7 million, which would later become for the whole church nearly $3 million, and we were on our way. You say, you're talking about money, not souls. Listen, man, this place is all about souls. But these are facilities that facilitate ministry. You, got, you can't put kids in a... You can't put... Sc- school in a warehouse. You have to build the standards and codes and meet all these things. But God's big enough to do that. You know, a penny is no different than a billion dollars to God. Like he he has it all. So whatever he wants to do, he can do. Uh, Now we got to work it out and we got to be faithful, but we've seen him be faithful along the way. But this this fella called up and cursed me out just a few days before we're going to have our pledges. And I didn't know then, but he's cursing me out because we're about to discover that he didn't actually own the land that he said he would give to us. He was renting it. And so, man, I hurt because I thought, oh my word, what have I done? I'm out here leading these people and we're going the wrong direction. That's what it felt like, right? But as I prayed, I felt like the Lord was with us. We went forward. God blessed it. But one of the things this guy said when he cussed me out is, who do you think you are? I'm going to build these buildings, raise this money and You got a plan, huh? And he just mocked me, just like Sam Belt and Tobiah. Well, here's the deal. It's not about who I am. Who is God? That's what this is about. Who is God? Does God have a plan? Did God put this plan in our heart? Does God want to do something? Because if he did, and he does, and we follow him, we see things happen, and we've seen things happen here. We're in the midst of it, but we're still, it's now, but some of it's not yet with where we're going. Galatians 6, 9 says, don't become weary in well-doing for it. At the proper time, you'll reap a harvest, harvest if you don't give up. Third thought, trying to, trying to move fast here. <clears throat> While you're going, help those in need. 
This is something we've learned. Did you know that Horizon Community Church, this church that runs about 800 people right now after the pandemic, Probably a couple thousand people call this their church, but we can't get them all here at once. It's just the way it works. But did, did you know that, that this church has given over $10 million to missions in the last 10 years? That's a lot for a church that size. And that generosity to help the poor, you just did a, an offering for 53, no, I'm sorry, it's risen to $56,000 for Ukraine and to to help refugees. You gave that just a month ago. It's out there with Convoy of Hope and it's their their boots on the ground. Your money is feeding people. You've cared about people. And we see Nehemiah caring about people even though he didn't see the mission as bigger than people. The mission was about God's people, right? Nehemiah 5.1. Now, the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their fellow Jews. Here's, Here's a problem they had. They're building, they're going, And all of a sudden, he discovers this terrible thing. People are being mistreated. Some were saying, we and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. They're they're starving. There's a shortage of food. Verse 3, others were saying, we're mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our homes to get grain during the famine. Still others were saying, we've had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. Verse 5, although... We are of the same flesh and blood as our fellow Jews, and though our children are as good as theirs, yet we have to be subject, we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Whoa. They've come out of slavery in Persia, and now the richest among them are taking excessive interest as they loan, and then they're taking the daughters and sons as their slaves. They've come from slavery, but they're making slaves. And God doesn't like this. And Nehemiah, the man of God, doesn't like it either. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, it says. But we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. Nehemiah says, when I heard their outcry and these charges, I was very angry. I pondered them in my mind and then accused the nobles and officials. So this is a dude that's coming against the most powerful in his nation. But he's coming to do what's right. He doesn't worry about what everybody thinks. He does the right thing. You know what doing the right thing does? It keeps you in good standing with God. (laughs) If God has a path for you, stay with him. That's what I would say in the long haul. Might not look good in the moment, but stay with God. He's staying with God. He doesn't worry about their power and their money. And I told them, he says, you are charging your own people interests. So I called together a large meeting to deal with them and said, as far as possible, we've brought back our fellow Jews who were sold to the Gentiles, saying we were in slavery before. Now you're selling your own people, only for them to be sold back to us. They kept quiet because they could find nothing to say. They know they're wrong. Verse 9, so I continue, what you're doing is not right. He just calls it out, man. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? I and my brothers... And my men are also lending the people money and grain, but let us stop charging interest. Give back to them immediately their fields, vineyards, olive groves, and houses, and also the interest you are charging them, 1% of the money, grain, new wine, and olive oil. And then they said, we will give it back. They listened to him. Takes courage, but when the woman of God steps up and does what God says, when the man of God steps up, there can be some good results courage is needed for the right things to happen. And we will not demand anything, it says. We won't demand anything more from them. We'll do as you say. So there's nothing in it for Nehemiah here. They, they, the salary, he doesn't care about it. He's pushing it away. The food that they give him, they give him this many cattle and sheep for his household, but he's giving it to the people, the story tells us. He's caring about people. As you go, care about people because it's all about people. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. There's nothing in it for Nehemiah but to build the kingdom. And when that's working right with the woman of God, with the man of God, good things can happen. When we were in Cambodia, we were there for 10 years. We're still doing things going to Cambodia. But when John Priest and I were there, I felt the Lord spoke to me and said, I want you to give a million dollars in the next 10 years into Cambodia. Well, I knew we were trying to build buildings here and I knew how much those buildings were and I talked to God about it and said, are you sure about that? 
But as we went and I prayed, I just felt it was just impressed upon me by God. I came back and told you guys about it. And here's how I know it was God, because I didn't give a great explanation. And in five minutes, you took it. We built 12 churches. You gave the money for that in Cambodia. We built homes to rescue young women from sex trafficking. We bought land to build Christian schools in Cambodia in that decade. We bought land for a drug rehabilitation center. And we didn't give a million in 10 years. We gave $2.7 million in 10 years. I felt like God said, if you will build here for my children who can't take care of themselves, I'll build for you there when you can't afford it. I'm like, okay, well, since we can't raise that much money, let's see what we can do. So I just, I, I want to tell you something. I hope you give me a break. I, I've never said this to you, but I, I believe I have a Nehemiah call. I've never even heard someone else say that, that I'm supposed to oversee the building of it. And I, I'm not even saying I love the call because you get criticized a lot in this. There's some of you wondering about the motives even now. Someday I'm going to walk away from this and all I can hope is that we built for the glory of God. And I'm going to believe that we're going to see hundreds of thousands of people come to Christ because of this house, because of this school. You say, how can that be? I don't know, 100 preachers, 50 missionaries, other Christian schools, people going out, moving around, loving Jesus, winning people to the lost. I I think we've seen tens of thousands come to Christ already. I think we can see hundreds before it's over. See, that's wild. I don't know, but there's no better goal, you know. How about that? But God is doing a miracle among us because after giving to Cambodia and being faithful and giving a million a year on the average, uh, he's doing a financial miracle. We're selling some land. We're not getting four million. We're getting four and a half for it. And then there's other things that are just coming to us and it's just a radical amount of money that's coming into our hands. Now, that's not for the daily operations. We still need your tithe, but this is for the future and what God is doing. And it looks like, have you seen the paint on the asphalt out there? Anybody notice that, that we've been doing some surveys? We're moving towards the building of the next building. And the money that is needed, we still have a mortgage and we're able to pay the bills right now. But the millions of dollars needed to build the next building it looks like we're going to have it all in hand and we're going to be able to build that building debt free. In 20 to 24 months, you could see what you're about to see on the screen. And I'm talking about building. That's what Nehemiah did. I'm talking about doing it for the glory of God. I'm talking about following his will. We're doing this together. But the middle building, the one you'll see on your right in the video is the one we're in. The one you'll see in the middle is the one that will, God willing, will be here in 20 to 24 months. And that third one is the high school that will be another building that will be here within a few years. That I'm hoping for that, all right? But we're on the move. Take a look at this video just so you can get a vision of what it could be. close with this verse today, Nehemiah 6, 15. 
at the end of the verse, it says, let's read from 60. When all our enemies heard about this, it had been finished. The wall was built. All the surrounding nations were afraid. They lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. We've had the help of our God going along here. We want to care about people, keep reaching. I'll tell you what it comes down to for me. I think Jesus is telling us this. It comes down to souls. That's what it's about. That's where we're moving. That's what the facilities are even about. God is doing it. Did you know that our school and our learning center will have over 700 children this year? It's the largest we've ever been. God is moving. Great things are happening. And we're going to keep moving forward. I hope this correlates for you and the dream would give you. You know what I prayed for today? I prayed for dreamers today. Not, not, even, not even a dream about this place. But that someone would take that thing that God's been speaking and move forward and say, okay, God, step by step. First step. First year. You give it to me and I'll follow and I'll be faithful. I want you to bow your heads and we're going to pray. Lord. Thank you for what you've done and what you're doing at Horizon. Thank you for what you've done and what you're doing in each soul here, each person's life. And God, I pray that you'd bless them right now.